First of all, Stoltenberg's warning. Uh, how do you think it will be received in Moscow? Will they shrug their shoulders or will they take it a little bit more seriously because we're now getting on for 18 months into this conflict? Uh, President Putin has been using uh, nuclear rhetoric, uh, especially since 2018, when he showed uh, a video on a large screen at a public event in Moscow of a nuclear-powered, nuclear-armed cruise missile flying halfway around the world and then landing in central Florida, not too far from Mar-a-Lago. Uh, Putin often uses uh, nuclear threats. Really, it's a way to kind of compensate for Russian uh, battlefield setbacks. Uh, and as the Russian military situation in Ukraine uh, still seems to be uh, declining, uh, I'm not surprised to see Putin now and, and uh, Belarusian leader Lukashenko you know, talk about moving Russian nuclear weapons into Belarus, uh, or um, uh, President, former President Medvedev talking about nuclear war. Uh, it's foolish rhetoric. Uh, we didn't seem to have some of this rhetoric at the end of the Soviet Union before the Cold War ended. Yeah, well, that was quite some time ago. We leave. We live in different times, don't we, William? And um, so, how seriously should one take the utterances of the? Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko, who claims his country has already started to receive those tactical nuclear weapons from Russia. Can one believe him? Uh, the Russians uh, may be transferring nuclear weapons over there, uh, but Lukashenko uh, also uses loose, uh, loose rhetoric, maybe even more so than Putin. He said uh, the other day, he said, I didn't ask Putin for these nuclear weapons. I demanded that right. Putin put nuclear weapons in Belarus. But the Russians would never allow the Belarusians to have control over those weapons, in part because the Russian authorities, the Kremlin, might worry that if one of those were loaded on a Belarusian airplane, that instead of flying west, the airplane might fly east and, and attack Russia. So uh, there's very little trust between those two countries. Really? I wouldn't I mean, pay any attention to well, Lukashenko's comments. Under what circumstances would um, <laughs> Lukashenko send a, a, a nuclear warhead east rather than west? I know, I'm not saying that he would do it, but I'm saying that it could end up happening. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, in NATO, uh, our practices are U.S. nuclear weapons in several countries in NATO – and pilots from those countries are trained to deliver these U.S. nuclear weapons. Uh, this, these are called dual-capable aircraft. Uh, this has been NATO practice all along. Uh, that um, uh, involves a level of trust that the Russians would never have with Belarusians. The Russians would never allow a Belarusian pilot to carry a U.S. nuclear weapon because that pilot may go in the opposite direction, yeah. especially after the protests in the summer of 2020 in Belarus, which showed that large numbers of Belarusians uh, want to go west. Yeah, in, in, indeed. And, and, and you talked about trust. What about trust between NATO members? Because I see Turkey is still holding out over Sweden's membership. People get very excited about Finland, but but but, but Sweden and um, the pathway for Kiev for um, Ukraine to join NATO. Well, it's still not clear, is it? Uh, it's not clear. But remember, Ukraine is fighting a war. So for Ukraine to join NATO while war is going on, that would be an unusual uh, activity. That would uh, put NATO right smack dab in the middle of a conflict that probably would be an imprudent step. Yeah. Uh, with regard to Turkey uh, and Sweden, uh, President Erdogan has uh, relied more and more on um, uh, rhetoric uh, and actions that are populist to try to stir up support uh, for his own rule at home. And uh, this has uh, unfortunately had an impact in NATO with regard to Swedish entry. But sooner or later, Erdogan will likely cave. Yeah. Uh, and the NATO alliance may need to provide some uh, incentive. For example, he wants uh, some F-16, advanced F-16 aircraft from the U.S. Uh, that could be part of the solution.
Mm -hmm. And um, we haven't mentioned the um, Ukrainian counteroffensive. I just think in the weeks leading up to it, uh, we saw all that shuttle diplomacy from President Zelensky. Uh, he went to Rome, he was in Berlin, he was in Paris, he went to Hiroshima, then he went to um, Moldova, didn't he? Is there any sense that what he demanded, he received? And as a result... And the Ukrainians can be trusted when they say they're making significant gains in uh, this counteroffensive. Because I'm hearing about small settlements, small villages, but nothing major yet in the east of the country. And uh, sadly, um, there are serious uh, casualties. That's also to be expected, but it means a very large amount of bloodshed. Uh, so it's useful to separate the flow of uh, weapons and other military support from uh, NATO allies to Ukraine uh, from the most recent trip. The most recent trip was uh, really an effort to kind of just basically uh, shore up uh, political support in NATO, which has actually been quite strong for Ukraine. The flow of weapons has been going on for many months into Ukraine. Uh, no one expected the first part of the war, uh, of the counteroffensive, to be easy because Russia has put in a lot of physical fortifications, you know, trenches and various other kinds of uh, obstacles. Uh, the Ukrainians have made some progress, uh, but this the amount of progress made thus far, for example, Ukrainians have not claimed over the last three days to have taken new villages. But as we've seen from... Ooh, William, I think you've disappeared for a second. Let's uh, see if you come back to us such as the nature of technology these days. Uh, I think we may have lost you. All right. William Courtney, the former special assistant to the US president for uh, Russia, Ukraine and Eurasia and former US ambassador to Kazakhstan. Ah, William, I think you're back with us. Hello. Okay, yes. Just to close, just to close that thought on um, this counteroffensive. Uh, yes. So the counteroffensive is likely to make more progress in the future. Um, but what I'm saying is, uh, don't look to day-to-day -day activity in the counteroffensive and make judgments about the larger uh, progress. Uh, there are a lot of uncertainties, uh, but Ukraine does seem to have a significant battlefield advantage and momentum. Uh, so I would uh, imagine we're going to see more uh, progress from Ukraine. 